Welcome everybody. Welcome to today's lunchtime webinar. Today we're talking about Eco Church Land with Helen Stevens from Arosha UK, the charity behind the Eco Church programme. You probably know that we have got 10 webinars this week all about different aspects of land and nature because Church's Count on Nature is going on right now as part of Beautiful Burial Ground Week. There are over 240 churches all around the country have registered to take part and they're going out and they're seeing what plants and birds and insects and trees they can record in their churchyards and to chime with that we're nationally running our week of webinars on land and nature and you are very welcome. So here's the upcoming webinars for the rest of this week. We're here at Eco Church Land this afternoon. You can hear about finding our faith in trees. We've got sessions tomorrow on how the church commissioners are managing their rural estate for climate and nature and on our flower rich churchyards and how to manage those best sessions on Thursday on the Nature Recovery Network and that one includes Tony Juniper from Natural England. Uh, session Thursday afternoon on using our church spaces for growing food and growing mission and then we end the week with a session on urban hope about how we use those small spaces for nature and then uh, finishing with, with the big picture of from global to local tackling the joint crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. Hopefully there's something there that's caught your eye. Please do book on. It's not too late. You can join even up until the last minute onto any of our webinars. Uh, once this week is over, I'll be turning my mind back to net zero carbon webinars. And we've got the second of our sessions on the faculty rule changes on the 16th of June. And then looking ahead to September after the summer break, we're running a session with Parish Buying and 2 by 2 about central procurement and how that can help with net zero carbon. So solar panels and energy audits and heating and the like. Uh, for today's housekeeping, it's the usual. So please type your questions into the Q&A not into the chat where they can get lost if you make sure your questions go into the q a and you can do a thumbs up next to other people's questions that you're interested in after today i'll send everybody helen's slides and also any links that are shared in the chat and we're recording each of these sessions and we'll be sharing them through our website it might take a few days given that we've got 10 webinars this week but they will all be there Right, Helen Stevens, you might well have heard her come and speak for us before. Uh, she is the, the very wise and very experienced church relations manager at Arosha UK, the Christian charity which runs the Eco Church programme and has supported thousands of churches through their Eco Church journey. If I stop sharing my slides, then Helen can slide. Oh, dearie me, I'm tongue, tongue tied today. Helen can share her slides and take us away. Thank you, Catherine. Let's get onto the right slide. There we go. That's working. Great, good. That's a good start. Well, it's lovely to be with you this afternoon. Um, Catherine, what a beautiful image that you've just shared by Nat Morley. I've not seen that before um, of the sixth mass extinction. Um, so clearly a very sad title. Um, but yeah, it really helps us to focus the mind as we come to think about land, or eco church land in this um, webinar today. So in many areas of life, land is thought of and has been treated as a commodity to be bought and sold and often just taken. Wars have been and clearly are being fought over land rights. And we could probably have a week's worth of webinars on attitudes to land. Certainly we don't have time to do justice to this today, and yet what we think of land and how we value it will probably determine a lot about how we treat and manage it. So yes, this um, quote from Mark Twain, um, I've subsequently seen it on t-shirts and all sorts of advertising, buy land, they aren't making it anymore. Well, what does the Bible um, say to us about land? Well, firstly, we know from Psalm 24 that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. God created the land, as we read in Genesis. Um, God had a covenant with Abraham about the land. He's gifted land across the generations. 
God provides for us through the land. There's so many beautiful illustrations of that in the Psalms. And also the land itself mourns and languishes. Indeed, darkness, uh, even to the extent that darkness came over the land um, at the death of Jesus on the cross. And then we know, too, that we're um, encouraged, uh, instructed to have a Sabbath for the land um, and how little we've done that in our sort of modern um, modern day, really, in the way that we treat the land and, and uh, farm it for all it's worth. And indeed, how we don't rest ourselves. So that all important idea of Sabbath. And then critically, how God restores people and creation together. And our vision at Arosha UK is all about helping to um, restore um, the land for people and nature. And then how about church and nature? So that's what we're here um, to talk about today, um, in particular about the eco church section um, or the, the category all around land. And whether we own land or have influence over it, ultimately the land belongs to God. But it's ours um, as, a, as a gift to treasure and to leave hopefully in a better state for future generations. Well, the state of nature in the UK landscape can make um, depressing reading. Um, we've we just had that image of the sixth uh, mass extinction. And we hear all the time about the near extinction of once common butterflies and birds, the arrival of invasive species, and the dramatic reductions in particular in insect populations, largely due to pesticide use on farmland and in our gardens and so on. And a UK-wide state of nature report in 2019 reported um, a 60% decline in insects since 1970. And there's that sort of, um, I guess, awful uh, kind of windscreen test. I remember growing up as a young girl, going for journeys, uh, and, and often the car window would be just smeared with so many insects. Um, and now there are very few of those. It's, it's almost like the litmus test for just how many we have lost. As Christians, though, we understand that the environment, both in the UK and globally, um, is under stress and that we've been called um, to care for it, partly as an expression of our love for God. Um, and how can we do that with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength? How can we love God in that way if we don't also honour and care for this beautiful planet which he has given us to live on? So the land section really is how we can be local and um, how we can be salt and light in our local areas and help to reverse the trends of species destruction, how we can manage the land for people and nature. We know from um, recent lockdown just how much we all need um, green spaces to revive and sustain us um, for our well-being. So in this land section, we encourage churches to be active in the environmental management of any outdoor space, uh, really whether you own or, or just have influence over it. So it could be a large rural churchyard, it might be a small urban space with no grass, it might be some community land nearby, um, which the church is or could be involved in. And really the questions in this category are to help churches to think about what's possible as they manage land or even a garden or other outdoor spaces for the benefits of native plants and wildlife and people. We've got lots of resources um, on our website um, all about how to encourage birds and animals, how to find out what grass and flower species you've got and how to create management plans. Um, so whether your space is large or small, um, having a sort of management plan and approach to the land can be useful to ensure that you're taking actions at appropriate times of year and also to help keep everyone informed of what's happening um, so that even those people that perhaps don't get involved in actively managing the land have a sense of um, shared responsibility and familiarity with how it's being cared for. And where are we ultimately trying to get to? Well, last year we set a new um, set a series of new goals at Arosha UK, and probably our biggest and overarching goal is that we want to see at least seventy five thousand acres of land owned by UK churches, Christian organisations um, like our partners in action around the country, such as Lee Abbey. Um, Abernethy Adventure Plus in Oxford and then individuals you and me um, if we've got garden spaces um, all being managed for nature to try and help to reverse um, the dramatic trends that we are seeing. 
in this country. And the UK is one of the most nature deprived um, countries in Europe, if not the world. And there is um, an expectation or a hope that of those 75,000 acres, that 3,000 acres at least will come from eco churches at the sort of parish and local level. So that doesn't include um, commissioner owned land, um, doesn't necessarily include denominational land, though hopefully that will contribute too. But it's um, a clear input at local level. Um, and it might be that we, uh, well, not might be, we, we want to deepen the engagement that all of our eco churches um, have with land. And then just to say very briefly, so the original section of eco church um, was quite light um, when it was uh, when the scheme was initially launched in 2016. And the feedback that we got was that some churches were struggling to progress to an award. Um, well, then we strengthened the section in 2018. Um, and also made it possible for churches to opt out of land. But to an extent, we'd really like to address the, the balance now and encourage all churches to look after land, even if it's only a perimeter border around the church. Um, and even if you still decide that you can't complete the whole land section. So rather than go through all of the questions, um, here's a wordle um, to give you a flavour of some of the ways in which you can look after your church land. Um, and all of these are linked to questions in the land category. So planting native wildflowers, avoiding um, pesticides and herbicides, um, encouraging uh, planting for pollinators like bees and other insects, having a management plan that I mentioned, maybe creating a bug hotel, growing fruit, undertaking wildlife surveys, which hopefully many of you are doing this week, week through Churches Count on Nature. And then in our resources, you'll find um, you'll find resources on all of these um, different areas um, that can hopefully help you to go further. Well, I could go through uh, lots of case studies, and indeed, I am certainly going to refer to bronze, silver and gold churches um, throughout the next um, 20, 30 minutes or so. And what I'd really like to do is try and weave a story about how you might approach this section of land starting where you are and probably starting small. Um, so you don't need a lot of space to plant something for pollinators. At Summerbridge Methodist Church in uh, Nidderdale, they completed their first survey in February 2019. And initially they left out the land section because they didn't think they had enough land to make a difference. Um, but actually they, they sort of consulted uh, with each other and across the congregation and thought that they should uh, do something on their land. And after a year of hard work, um, they carried out an audit again in January 2020. And at that point, they decided they would include um, the land questions because they'd been able to take a number of actions to encourage wildlife and make the space environmentally friendly. Now, I know you don't particularly get an impression of it from these slides, but it, I, I, there's something else shortly that I'll share that shows you that it really is just a perimeter but they have a Nidderdale art festival every year. Uh, one of the years it was on the theme of nature. And I just thought even this beautiful artwork on the side of the church can really help to um, people to, to connect and to think about nature and perhaps in a faith context. And then uh, even in a small corner, um, they can put, they've put some planters in um, made from recycled tires that were decorated um, by some of the children. They write that they've um, left ivy to grow on the fence um, to provide a habitat for bugs and nesting birds. Um, the hedges and over overhanging trees are only trimmed outside the nesting season. So that's just March to August. And they have minimal pruning to ensure that they don't impede um, or access, uh, impede access to the building. So they manage it as they need to. They've got self-seeding uh, self native wildflowers that are left to grow. Um, native wild garlic and um, they do have a stream bank at the back of the church it's not within their church ground um, but there's uh, lots of native species along there um, where but uh, as well as nettles where butterflies um, can lay their eggs and they've been given wildflower seeds from um, ecotricity which I think is a local partner um, and as I said they've they've um, sown some of those um, in the tires around the church and then going to Italy, um, to Palermo um, in Sicily, 
This uh, is an innovative story of developing a city forest, um, a microcosm oasis, and a biodiversity sustainability project. So you can see um, from the slide there that once again, the church does not have a lot of land around it. It's got some trees um, in the forecourt, um, but the railings sort of define their land. It's a, it's a small space. And they write, spring is in the air at the Church of the Holy Cross. And in a pocket sized flower bed of just two square meters, usually the destination of last Christmas's Ponsettias, Palermo's first sustainability concept of city forest was developed to, come, to become a microcosm paradise for nature, inviting and encouraging inner city flora and fauna to find an oasis. The city forest is today a place for small birds to come drink, feed and nest in the previously semi-abandoned flower bed and over pruned trees that will be now encouraged to fill out more naturally. They write how they chose the plants um, for the shady limited soil, um, and uh, they've now got also an area with a bird bath and nesting baskets and so on. And one of the things that they've noticed is the unexpected, um, the spin off, the positive domino effect on neighbours who've started greening their balconies and windowsills and their gardens too. So you don't need necessarily to create a wildflower meadow, a windowsill, a doorstep, a balcony or a terrace. It's all space enough in our church or in our homes to have plants that can attract butterflies and bees and also at the same time um, clean the air and give a sense of well-being. And then coming to St James's Piccadilly, um, which you can see is in the heart of London, surrounded by office blocks and buildings. There are some other patches of green space, but St James's stands out um, partly because of the plane trees, which provide shade for lunchtime office workers and leaves, uh, which they compost. And whilst this is a bird's eye view rather than a bee's view, um, they are actually on the bee line providing um, a critical source and path for pollinators to navigate across the city, just to emphasise really how important it is that we use every available area of land um, that's possible to create um, a route like that for pollinators um, for the benefit of wildlife. And also, whilst they don't have um, a pond at St James's, um, they've got a little bit more space than Summerbridge Methodist, um, they're nevertheless um, an urban city church. They don't have loads of land, um, not enough for a pond, but they have, as you'll see from the third uh, picture here, created um, a bog garden um, in some buckets. And I was there just a few weeks ago. And although this, these photos were taken a couple of years ago now, um, that bog garden is still growing strong. So hopefully, um, sorry, I was going to come to Summerbridge again, just to um, re-emphasise uh, the narrowness of the strip um, around their church. Uh, they're now a gold, I think I said that. And although they said no to a pond or a wetland area, um, they have uh, made a small water feature out of a recycled dustbin bin lid to attract birds and dragonflies and so on. Um, and although they've only got this perimeter of land, they've managed to create some space for wildflowers, which are naturally um, reseeding. So I hope that this can help you to see that any um, church undertaking the actions that we've highlighted so far, even on a very small amount of land, can get a bronze award. Um, OK, I've shared with you some examples of gold churches here, but even some of these gold churches started out thinking that they couldn't do anything with their land. And then they reconsidered and they've subsequently uh, done a lot on their land. Um, and these spaces are thriving. Coming on to the question of whose land is it anyway, um, and we've we talked at the start about um, all of all of the land belonging to God, but in the sense of how we manage it in our day to day lives, um, you may say, well, it's all very well, but actually your church doesn't even own the land. Uh, it might be a closed church land and it might be um, managed by the council. Well, this is the case for St Cuthbert's Church in Low Etherley, um, but they still managed to get a silver in February 2022. Um, they have got a closed churchyard and the council maintains it. So it's the council that makes decisions regarding that land management. But they've still, um, in conjunction with the council, 
um, been able to influence them to establish a wildlife area in the churchyard, um, which the council prepare in February and then seed with native wildflowers. Um, and which the PCC um, agree to maintain. They've got wildlife feeding stations and a large bug hotel um, and bird and hedge boxes. Um, and they've also established a relationship with a local hedgehog rehabilitation centre. So it is possible to do something um, even with closed land, but it might be um, that you decide that you can't do anything on the land that you've got. Um, but even so, it still might be possible to get to a bronze award um, by uh, thinking creatively. Please bear with me. I'm just going to try and go into a video and share this with you if I have got the right one open. Of. Welcome to Langhorst Community Garden, which has been the product of a partnership between Langhorst School, Langhorst Church Eco Team, and the Village Hall Committee. It's a wildlife garden which is on the site of a little piece of derelict land close to our village hall. It all came about really as, as a, a a sort of happy coincidence. Langos Church for a few years now has been an eco church and quite quickly we got our bronze award but we were struggling to get our silver award. It required more things being done and one of the things which would have got us towards that is doing something for wildlife or something with gardening but our church churchyard is owned by the local council, so we couldn't do it there. And for a long time, we felt frustrated. And then, coincidentally, the local community were reciting the play park in the village, and Mel Rosies came to me and said, we've got this rough bit of land next to the play park, can you do anything with it? And I thought, great, that's our wildlife site. Just down the road, on the other side of the village hall, is our local school, which is an eco school and a church school, and has an incredibly keen eco committee in year six, who were keen to come along and help us. What they did was, we had a site meeting, showed them what there was, and they went away and designed a garden, and research the kind of plants that we ought to put into it to encourage um, insects, bees, butterflies, hoverflies, and uh, seed plants which birds would like, providing a bit of cover and shelter for uh, beetles and small mammals and things. And it all came together. We started the planning last September. We planted some bulbs at the end of the autumn term, and then this term, um, the local village hall people and the church eco team prepared the site and the children came and did the planting just a few weeks ago. So what you see now is the result of a few months work and it's not yet established but it will very soon look really beautiful. We've been trying to make a more eco-friendly garden for bees, butterflies and wildlife so they can make it their home. We've enjoyed that we get to work together and share each other's ideas to make and make a wonderful garden. It's a, it's a really nice place to come down and enjoy yourself, maybe have a picnic and just look at the beautiful garden because in, in the summer it's, it's just going to look amazing. It's so important to our school that we have that the children feel really rooted in their community and really connected to the place where they live and where they're growing up and to the people who support them in the community. So this project working on our garden and making Langhorst a beautiful place but also working with other adults from the church and from the village hall together has been a really important project for us. Well, I do love some of the comments from those children. Um, one or two of them look a little bit cold. Um, let me just go back to, uh, there we go. So uh, St. Paulinus, yes, they've still managed, um, well, they're working towards silver, as the lady said there. Um, 
and doing that in conjunction with um, the school. So there's a lovely um, relationship that's developed there. So it's also about um, potentially working with others in partnership and St Paul's Marylebone, one of our most recent gold awarded churches, um, have done just that. In fact, they've got all sorts of partnerships. I'll pick up some more of them a bit later on. Um, but one in particular with Christchurch um, C of E Primary School Eco Club. And um, this is a lovely story of the children having been able to watch um, or hatch some eggs and then donate the chicks to the church. Um, again, a church with not much land, but the, the hens um, are looked after in the rectory grounds. Um, so maybe you can persuade your <laughs> clergy out there to keep chickens. Um, and it's just lovely that it sounds like uh, during Lent, they, they share a community breakfast um, of freshly laid eggs. Um, yeah, and they've also uh, they've also worked with um, Church Street Ward Neighbourhood Forum um, and many other organisations, um, which we will come back to. But again, I hope that's demonstrated to you um, that you really don't need much land on which to make a difference. And rather than discounting um, the section of land because you feel that you haven't got that much, you can perhaps think creatively about other ways in which you can look after an area of land, um, a derelict area of land that nobody seems to be taking care of. Um, maybe approach the council in particular if you've already got that relationship with them because they're managing a closed church yard. I know that it's not always straightforward and easy. We have had questions about what to do on closed church land. We are in the middle of developing a resource, um, hopefully with some good case studies from churches that we know that are out there um, that do have that that have uh, managed to influence the council and that do work jointly with councils um, to manage the land. Coming on to um, Questions such as est establishing a mowing regime, maybe planting um, trees, carrying out wildlife surveys, certainly for the first two of those, it is the case that with some of the questions in the land section, um, they're more applicable to a larger area of land. Uh, such was the case for All Saints and, uh, with St Frideswide, um, who got their silver in February of last year. So their main environmental work in 2020, um, as, as you can see, this is from their website, was on their church land. Um, and in addition to the things uh, that they'd mentioned uh, in their questionnaire comments, they'd also they'd introduced large no-mo areas uh, on the back of their land. They drew up a land management plan for the whole site. They put in rainwater collection from one of their outbuildings um, and they reseeded the wildflower garden. Um, they put beehives on their land, they've planted a fruit orchard with 17 trees, installed four benches for people to sit on, and they have a raised herb garden. You can uh, you can read some of this on here. But even their mini ponds, so in the second row down, the second photograph, um, that's all they've done is just sort of create some sunken um, areas. I've, I, I know of people that use washing up bowls, um, something really simple that you can use to create um, like a mini wild pond with um, hopefully stones and things around it so that creatures can can also climb out if they need to. Um, and then one of the things that struck me uh, is that they report back regularly to the congregation on what is flowering um, in their wildflower garden. Um, and again, that's a lovely way of keeping people informed, hopefully keeping people interested um, in what's going on. Mickleton Methodist Church uh, got a silver award a couple of years ago now, and a key thing for them was developing a wildlife garden on the unused land behind the church. Um, and that, they said that came about because again, they were thinking, well, how do we move on from our bronze to our silver status? Not that it's all about the award, but that provided impetus for them. And they raised money from local businesses um, who and uh, I think they had seeds. Uh, wildflower seeds donated. The furniture that you can see there is from recycled plastic, and that was given to them by businesses. And they've got a whole load of um, information display boards along the back of the church, um, showing people what might be um, what might be found there. Um, and they've got this kind of cottage style um, garden now, um, which people can enjoy together. Um, this lovely space for people and nature. 
Um, and this brings me to um, thinking of times in the year that perhaps provide an impetus for us to do something different. Uh, we have just gone through the month of No Mo May, um, which was a, a campaign, I think it was started by Plant Life. It's been going on for a few years now. And I was encouraged um, to notice a couple of signs up in the area where I live, where people had left a sign on the verge, trying to encourage the council not to mow it. Um, we've done the same in our front garden. Um, which uh, looks quite messy at the moment, but it's um, it's it's brought up lots of flowers and grasses and so on, which are great for wildlife. So it might be that you could uh, pick up on a campaign like that and think, well, we're going to try something different for this month and cut our grass a bit less often. And although that's uh, kind of pitched around May, I think the overall idea of it is to encourage people to think of less about having uh, neat and orderly spaces and, and to create or leave space um, for wildlife. And it might be that we need signage, um, specific signage that will help people um, to see and understand that. So this is St Mary's in Wendover. Um, and you can see that whilst um, I think this might be a closed churchyard, but you can see that um, whilst on the one hand it might look a bit messy, it's um, probably very, very rich area for conservation. And after a no-mo, um, not that you need to wait for that, uh, maybe you can then see what's come up on your land, the sorts of um, plants that begin to emerge, the species that it attracts, um, just by leaving the area a little bit more untouched. And that leads me to Church's Count on Nature, which of course is the week that we're in and why we're having this series of webinars. Um, and it's all about understanding and celebrating what's on our local church doorsteps. And so here's just a couple of um, highlights from last year. Um, I was out um, visiting a church in Ham um, and was chatting to these two gentlemen who were actually um, doing some repairs on the church from um, a vandalism incident, but they were also keen to show off this lovely bug hotel, um, which is very palatial. Um, but they subsequently got involved in Churches Count on Nature and um, it happened to be that a Kew botanist was wandering past, this is not far from Kew Gardens, um, and got involved in helping them. And I think even on their small area of land in the middle of an estate, they counted something like 100 species of plants, um, including a rare bee orchid. And there were many more examples of this from last year. Um, a church in Krakowl, uh, they had a messy church afternoon in the churchyard looking at flowers and insects and lichen and they had a prayer time and a picnic and then it was the youth group that did the flower survey and the lichen survey so it's also a lovely way of involving um, different groups from within our church congregation. And then coming back to churches working in partnership which I referred um, a little bit to earlier in passing um, when I was talking about St Paul's in Marylebone, um, the team that went up to assess their Gold Eco Church Award just recently were um, completely, I think, blown away by the amount of work that they are doing in partnership um, on land that they don't actually own, um, but which they've really taken on um, as uh, taken on board to care for. Um, I mentioned the Church of England Primary School. Um, project. I think they've been involved with them at least since about 2018 um, when they got involved in planting new trees as part of the Trees for Cities project. And then over the last eight years as well, so way preceding Eco Church, their time with Eco Church, um, they've also worked closely with Church Street Ward Neighbourhood Forum to focus on the built environment and how we can work um, to improve our green spaces and housing and community facilities and so on. Um, and how people could have a say in the plans for the regeneration around um, Church Street, um, which is close to where they are, uh, where they are based. Um, so this is this is the sort of zone within the blue lines um, where their church is. If you can ju just pick out Church Street there, they're not on Church Street, but they're they're just just off that. And working in partnership. Um, with the Church Street uh, Neighbourhood Forum. They've hosted public meetings um, over the years with Westminster County Council um, to discuss plans for regenerating the area and to listen to their community. 
And they said that out of that project, it was evident that environmental concerns, particularly around green spaces, play spaces, air quality, the use of land for community facilities came out top um, on the community wishes for the area. And so they were part of the neighborhood forum and um, then compiled a neighborhood plan um, which the council will have to work towards as part of the regeneration of the area. Um, and you can see that as the regeneration begins to take place, the, the slide on the right, um, they want to create this, uh, or, or have already started to create this green spine through the centre of their community um, to enhance play and green spaces for the whole community to use. And they write, as an eco church, this commitment to our local community and the neighbourhood forum is an important part of how we see our impact on the land and environment around us, extending beyond the immediate church land outside our building to the land and environment in our parish for which we've been given a duty of care and stewardship. And it's, it's a really holistic vision that they have. It's um, the lived environment, green spaces, um, it, it's seeing, seeing it in a very holistic way um, for all of the people that live in that community. Um, and it's really, they've said it's really given them a steer for their work as an eco church um, and for their ongoing um, engagement with um, the, the neighbourhood forum and with Westminster, Westminster City Council. Um, and they, they already have one of these green spine routes um, making a safe space. Uh, safe space this is there we are members of the team um enjoying that first sort of green spine open through the parish so yeah i mean they they uh sort of had a very well i don't think they answered land originally but it was very clear uh that what they were doing um was was very extensive and really a key part of who they are Coming on um, almost finally to the example of Hazelnut Community Farm, um, which Sarah and I visited just a couple of weeks ago um, down in Bristol. So at this time that we're in of heightened energy prices and food insecurity and ecological breakdown, in many ways, Hazelnut Community Farm um, couldn't be a more appropriate and timely expression of church. And it's a very different expression of church. It's a church without walls. Um, I think um, as Reverend John White, the, the third person in the in the inset picture, said um, that they're, they're growing the walls of their church and those walls change depending on the seasons and what's going on. They are um, based uh, behind um, a Methodist church, which is due to be sold off. The congregation, sadly, uh, is closing there. They don't yet know what the future of the church will be, but this area of land uh, they are really working to restore and they meet there um, not just weekly, but throughout the week. Um, and, and having this community garden space um, is really, uh, really who they are. And as uh, John's vision for the church plant is that it would have at its core a church rooted in nature, a sacred space that engaged deeply with the climate emergency. And he had that vision about three years ago and sort of 21 months or so of work, they've now got this um, really beautiful um, garden and space. And from first glance, it's not obviously a church space. Um, like I said, there are no walls, but um, when we visited, there was a group of men there um, who were working together to clear a path. And those men were um, sort of supporting each other in preparation for supporting a team of ex-offenders that were going to uh, visit the site, um, I think a bit later this month, um, to really sort of get alongside them. The land is being used um, in all sorts of ways. So there are vegetable and flower beds there. There's a peace garden. There's, there's this newly mown um, labyrinth with a chair in the centre for anyone um, drawn to, to go and have some contemplative time. And it really felt like a lovely reflection of, um, in John's words, how their rhythm of worship and teaching revolves around themes of creator, creation and community. And they teach all three of those. Um, and it's so evident in the way that they are trying to help. There's a lot of food insecurity in the communities of Lockleys and Upper Hallfields where they work. And they are really, they're growing what they've been given. They're trying things out um, and they are having a really uh, far and wide reach. Um, in fact, I, I'm pretty sure that John is doing a webinar later in the week. I think it might be Thursday 
Uh, and I'm sure that will be absolutely brilliant and inspiring. Um, and their reach extends so far. Uh, they've got these two sites, but they are also really uh, creating a network of churches around the country. And they're, they're encouraging. They've got this vision of a big harvest this autumn um, where they really are encouraging people to connect to harvest by growing and giving food away um, as a spiritual exercise and a way to engage with food poverty. And just imagine our churches filled um, with harvest offerings for food banks of freshly, uh, fresh locally grown produce um, alongside the, the sort of the tins and, and the manufactured produce. Um, so it's so hard, food is very much at the heart um, of who they are, um, but absolutely that theme of creation and creator and community. And then once a month, <coughs> excuse me, they have, um, the, they do the table in the garden, which is communion. Um, so they, they have their own uh, rhythm. Um, as well. And then finally, just to flag to you um, that new for this year, um, we are offering a series of Act for Nature Days. Um, the 25th of June uh, is, is the one coming up soon. That's in at our Wolffields Reserve in West London. We have one in Northern Ireland, another one at our reserve in North Essex, and then one down in Hillfield Friary in Dorset. Um, that's one of our partner in action uh, sites and these are days that will provide um, demonstrations and training to churches individuals um, and other partners in action on specific conservation techniques um, relevant for both large and small um, sites from wildflower planting uh, and they're also family days um, so actually this photo was taken from a day that we had at Wolffields last year uh, of some impromptu pond dipping um, which some of the children uh, were able to do and really enjoyed. Um, so please, if you're near to any of those sites, um, you'd be very welcome and we'll um, share the registration uh, links after this. And that, that is me, Catherine. I think that gives us uh, just over 15, 20 minutes or so for some questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much. What amazing examples. Such creativity and and love in those examples isn't there uh right we have got some questions in the q a one of them comes my way because it's about the faculty system so why don't i answer that one whilst you have a have a skim and see what is coming so there's a question from hillary about do we always need a faculty to plant some tiny trees you can sense a, a frustration in that question can't you so I have got open the faculty rules and um, but probably everyone listening knows there's list A, which means things you can get on with, list B, which means you need reference to your architect, if not your architect, try that again, reference to your archdeacon and you need your archdeacon to confirm whether you need faculty or there's full faculty. And tree planting is on list B. So that means um, you need to contact your archdeacon and you need to confirm whether the particular trees that you're planning to plant in the particular spot that you're planning to plant them do or don't require faculty. I would suspect that if they are tiny trees um, in a spot that doesn't have archaeological significance, your archdeacon might well be um, willing to give permission, but it's it's in their say as to whether it requires full faculty or not. So B7 covers the planting of trees and the felling of a tree that is dying or dead or has become dangerous and all other works to trees apart from the things which were mentioned earlier as being very minor works which are under list A. The general exemption to anything being done without faculty will always apply and that includes anything which will affect the archaeology of the area and it will also include if planting the tree would affect the space for graves in the future. So those are the kind of things your archdeacon is probably going to have in mind if you do approach them and say that we want to plant some trees. Is, is there any impact on archaeology? Is there any impact on the number of grave spaces? 
I suspect the other thing that they will want to know, because we've seen it happen so many times, is whether the tiny tree is going to become a big tree and whether the roots are going to damage uh, pathways or stonework and whether when it's grown, the boughs will come over the gutters, uh, because a lot of churches have issues with leaf fall into the gutters and then that making it harder to keep the rain water goods clear. So those are the kind of things your archdeacon will probably want to know. But just to confirm that, tree planting is under a list B matter, not under full faculty, unless your archdeacon says that in your circumstances it does need a full faculty application. Uh, right, let us go back to the questions and have a look. Uh, the first one is about ecodiasis uh, and whether you could say a little bit more about how land is treated within the ecodiasis framework um, and if there's anything more you can share on that. Yes, sure. I read, I read these questions in the wrong order, but yes, I can start with ecodiocese. So when ecodiocese uh, was, was set up and, and similar denominational schemes a couple of years back, um, at bronze level, very simply, it was the encouragement for diocese synods and so on to have an environmental plan. <clears throat> um, in the time since then, the environmental crises have heightened, um, land has become, it's always been a focus for us, and we recently strengthened certainly the silver criteria around ecodiocese, and in that um, uh, environment policy that there, there should be um, far more reference to land and having a plan for land, and a key part of that is understanding what's on the land and really trying to map it. Now I appreciate that might not be easy for every diocese but um, I think there is, you know, there's a lot of information that already exists um, for example about sites of special scientific interest and so on and it's really uh, the, the starting point is trying to understand what the diocesan land is what state it's in um, and then uh, actually coming up with a plan um, to manage it to, to proactively try to improve it um, and although land is not within uh, the net zero goal um, to, to try to manage it for carbon reduction, um, doing many of the activities that I've sort of referred to during Eco Church. Um, but it's early days on that. I think we've got some work to do um, with dioceses uh, in terms of trying to pilot exactly what um, that might look like. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is from Alan, which is a, a lovely idea to do with tree planting. It says, with the abundance of tree planting schemes with free saplings on offer, could Eco Church make it one of the potential activities that churches set up groups which plant trees in the gardens of local people who could not do it themselves and also provide an annual check and maintenance? It would be a witness of engagement with the community. It's a, it's a lovely idea, isn't it? I mean, there's, uh, presumably there's nothing to stop a church going ahead and setting up a scheme like that yeah absolutely it is it is a lovely idea um i mean yeah i mean just to say we that people often ask us could could we include this could we include that i mean what what we have in the survey is is a framework if you like we'd love for people to uh, generate ideas like this and and get on and make them happen um it, it, it was a slightly related um that, you know i know a, a church that i used to go to um took receipt of um, some native trees a couple of years back but we didn't have space to plant ourselves so they were donated to a local nature reserve so I think any ways in which churches can yeah help to re re-establish and um, plant trees in other parts of our communities is fantastic and yes doing that for, for elderly or the less able it's a lo lovely idea. Um, it, there's a scheme a little bit like this where I live but it's not run by the church but it's the kind of thing it would be worth you finding out whether whether it's already going on through a wildlife group in your area because where, where I live in St Albans Wilderhood Watch which is um oh, they're just lovely local volunteer residents they've been trained up by the local wildlife trust to be wildlife um champions and they'll go and they'll visit homeowners and give them advice about what they could do in their gardens to encourage nature and biodiversity in their gardens. Uh, so there are things like this going on and it might be worth your parish reaching out to your local wildlife trust or other nature organisations and see what's already going on because maybe you can link in with something that's already happening. Uh, the next question is from Alison, which I think is particularly about where the parish is a very 
urban one and mm -hmm. near to a busy road. Um, Alison says an issue that came up when submitting my own church's application last year was the proximity of church land to a major arterial road from this city to the airport and increasing use of the church land has health and safety concerns around traffic and pollution. Can you advise on anything that they can do? That is a, that's a taxing problem. It is, yes, and I suspect quite a common one given how much more urbanisation is going on. Um, so things that come to mind, I don't know how much space you've got, Alison, but maybe planting some um, sort of hedge boundaries, natural boundaries, um, plants, I know they, or trees potentially, depending on the space of land and what's suitable, um, to help try to absorb some of that pollution and perhaps also as a bit of a sound barrier for the church. Um, I wonder if you could put up some signage, perhaps discouraging car idling. I don't know if you're literally on a main road or if there's anything like a traffic lights near you. Um, I, I, my, I think schools probably come across similar problems here where there's a lot of, you know, traffic outside and people trying to get to school safely. Um, I don't, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a very valid challenge. We will uh, see if we can find some examples from other churches perhaps um or if people can maybe put in the chat um thoughts that come to mind but i would have thought natural yeah uh, some sort of boundaries that try and protect the space a bit from the road maybe also engaging with the council and looking at what the kind of roads what the traffic plans are um i know it's just, um decreasing the speed limit can often be unpopular but you know that that can make a huge difference to levels of pollution right the next question is from lisa which is about rats we have a stream next to our church which is home to some rats because this we're unable to use bird feeders etc as it attracts the rats has anyone ideas how to overcome this thanks uh, if anyone's come across an excellent bird feeder that is rat proof please do pop it in the chat I'm, I'm picturing all of the many different solutions that my dad tried to come up with for preventing the squirrels uh in his case um with greasing it and hanging it from ropes and there are special ones where if you put the weight of it then it pulls them down um i don't know how if you've got anything to add on that uh no, I, I, I'm sure, I mean, squirrels are pretty ingenious. <laughs> I would have thought that's a good place to start, Catherine. Cats come to mind, but I know they're not great for the birds themselves. Um, no, I'd love to hear what people think about that. We've, we've heard this comment occasionally. Um, uh, then next question from Emma. Do churches ever identify church commissioners land in their local area and approach them to increase nature restoration on that land? Have you come across that in your travels? um i'm i i'm trying to think now i'm aware of perhaps a general move to try and understand what's going on on church commissioner land i don't know about specific um churches that have done that um, oh somebody has suggested a kind of feeder in the in the chat the finch's friends feeder obviously other bird feeders are available but there's there's one to have a look at. Uh, Mary Rose has written, how do I find the list of other webinars this week shown earlier on? Uh, I've, I put it right at the very beginning. If you scroll up in the chat um, to the first time I've commented, I've put in there the link through to all of the other webinars this week. But when I send you the slides and the links after we finish today, I'll make sure that it's in there as well. Uh, Tamsin has asked, I looked after, I look after a closed churchyard for a local in bloom group. How would it be best to approach improving the biodiversity? Where might I find assessment resources? I, I wonder if actually a survey might be a good place to start, try to understand what, what's on the land already. Um, I don't know if you've got anything planned for this week, Tamsin, but maybe a sort of plant um, count could be a good place to start. Um, we do have resources in the land section of EcoChurch. Um, Caring for God's Acre have some great resources. I think you'll also find those in the Church's Count on Nature section. Um, and then 
maybe, uh, I, I don't know your relationship with the local in bloom group, but maybe talk to them about some of the wonderful array of plants that are available um, for pollinators and so on. And if you can um, make sure that you've got a good selection of those. I think different colored plants are also um, quite important. So I'm just popping in the chat a link through to the Care and for God's Acre resources. They have they have wonderful resources on there about churchyard management. And Andrea from Caring for God's Acre is running the webinar this week on blooming in beautiful flower rich uh, grasslands. So I would suggest really come along to that one or watch the video when it's come up on our website, because that's really practical information about managing your churchyard to encourage native wildflowers. Uh, how are we doing? We've got five minutes left. Three questions in there. Um, Anna's asked about Wilderhood Watch. Would they visit churches too, do you think? Um, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm showing my ignorance. I don't know whether Wilderhood Watch is just a St Albans thing or whether it's a national charity. So I'm afraid you'll, you'll just have to Google it and see. Uh, so it's Wilderhood Watch. Um, but like I say, I, I just know there happens to be a group in our local area. Um, but there are wildlife trusts all around the country. So if you go on and you look on the Wildlife Trust website and you there's a section where you can say, you know, find the one near me. Um, and some dioceses have started building really good links with their local Wildlife Trust uh, to partner uh, for resources in the local area. Um, not sure whether my question about the list of this week's webinars. Uh, so Mary Rose is asking again about the, about this week's webinars. So I've I've put the link and I'll send it to you again. Um, she was asking whether it's also on your website, Helen, as well as on yes. the Church England website. Uh, yes, they are. Um, it's on our events page. So if you go to the Arosha UK website to the events page, uh, you should find a list of the webinars um, on there as well. Lovely. And then the final question is from Jeff. Do you know if many churches have a designated eco committee as part of their PCC? I certainly know of, ch of churches that have um, eco champions, eco teams, and some that have PCCs that would encourage those eco teams, if you like, to sort of report regularly um, to their PCCs, um, if that's the sort of thing that you mean. And again, coming back to eco diocese, eco synod, um, that's quite a key part of that for there to be a, a committee um, at that level as well. Does, I hope that answers the question. I think so. Um, and certainly when you've done your getting started mm -hmm. webinars for us, mm -hmm. that's I think that's come up every time we've run it, hasn't it? Was how do I gather a team around me? That, that often there's a lone individual who's who's who, who wants yeah. to get Eco Church going. And actually, if the first thing you can do is gather a group, then that's so powerful, isn't it? And I think nature is a really good way into doing that. That it's probably easier to, to start gathering a group on the land section of eco church because so many people care and love being outside and then perhaps that group then grows into something that's taking forward the other sections of eco church as well yeah i think that's very true catherine um e you know even doing something as gentle as going for a walk taking some litter pickers <laughs> with you um doing something this week having a just using our outdoor space and helping people to make connections between the outdoor space and nature. Yeah. Lovely. We're just coming up towards one o'clock. Let me just ask you as a as a final a final question, Helen. If people are listening and feeling inspired by your wonderful examples, where should they start? <laughs> oh gosh. Um, well, if you've got children or young people in your church, I think involving them in looking after the land can be a lovely place to start. So summer bridge, as I said, you know, those tire planters that were painted, they did that at children's summer club. I know of another church that ran a competition for their youth to design a bug hotel. And then somebody else in the church got on and built that. So, but I appreciate not every church will have children or young people. Um, that said, if you then go to St. Paul's Marylebone, you know, they connected with the church school and the young people, um, you know, that the, the the benefits were were flowing both are flowing both ways there, and they've got that lovely example with the chicks. Um, so I do think there's something about connecting with with children and young people. Um, but then, as to your point, Catherine, just you know, enjoying 
the land taking time together to be outdoors in nature um, and, and to yeah take time to celebrate what it is that we have on our doorsteps, even if we're in a very urban area. Wonderful. And of course, Bridge of Eco Church. And yes, I haven't already. Yes, there is an assumption. Already. Yes, I please do that church. as well. And oh, yeah, yeah. join this wonderful growing community of churches doing all sorts of things. We've, you know, we've only touched on a couple this morning or this afternoon, but there are many more. Um, so I maybe think, yeah, just see what other churches are doing. Sorry. I just think such a great place that it's just to it's just to register and read the questions. Yeah. And it, it, you know, just just sit down and read the questions, and then you get such a good sense of, of what eco church is and how it works and the kind of things. And remember that getting to bronze doesn't mean saying yes to all of the questions. Mm -hmm. Get bronze is twenty five percent of the questions That's right. yeah. are a yes, yeah. uh, which I think makes it all seem a lot more manageable. So if your church hasn't already registered, please do register. Have a look at the questions and keep in mind that bronze is is twenty five percent. Right, let me save the chat so we don't lose those links and then say thank you to you, Helen, as always, for bringing your practical wisdom and wonderful examples and wonderful photographs that bring it to life. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. I do hope you're feeling inspired to go and take some action um, and do come along to our other webinars this week. Uh, later today, I'll send you around the slides and all the links from the chat uh, so that you can um, Refresh yourself, everything you've heard today, and the recording will be on our website in a few days' time. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Bye bye.